The focus of this session is structural and functional magnetic resonance imaging. fMRI attracts a lot of media attention and this may in part be the result of people's misunderstandings about the tool. Most of this comes from the fact that you are working with very complicated pieces of machinery that require a great deal of understanding with regards to med medical physics and statistics which most people do not possess. So the media like to sell some of the findings to the general population without going into so much detail as to fully understand what is actually being done. They simplify the results and in simplifying much of the information is lost and all of a sudden we are talking in terms of the brain lighting up which of course it does not do. fMRI is a relatively new piece of technology. It was only in 1990 that Ogawa and colleagues first demonstrated the bold response in rats. Bold is the signal of interest in fMRI and I'll explain more about that in a moment. The first bold response in humans was measured by Kwong and colleagues in 1992. An fMRI is exciting stuff and has increased in popularity since the bold signal was first measured. The main points that I'd like you to consider this lecture are what MRI is and what it is measuring. This includes the principles behind the images we obtain. I'd like you to challenge your assumptions about MRI. We will cover what the limitations of MRI are, what interpretations we can make from the signal we, we receive, and how to set up a basic fMRI experiment. Finally, we will briefly cover an introduction to diffusion tensor imaging. We can see some pictures of an MRI scanner here. <clears throat> it's a tunnel that the patient is placed inside of. What surrounds the person is a large magnet. The scanner is controlled by the computer in the control room, which is next to the scanner, so the patient can be seen. And it produces images of different tissue contrast, which we can see here. We can get different images of the person's brain, depending on the scan sequence that we use. People will often say, I've had an MRI scan, but there are many different types of scans. They're not all showing us the same thing. And the MRI scanner isn't just for taking pictures of the brain. It can also be used for other parts of the body to image different tissues such as fat and muscle. We can see the patient going inside the scanner feet first in order to place the area of interest into the bore of the magnet. In other words, the place of the magnet where fewest inhomogeneities in the magnetic field can be found. Magnetic coil sits in liquid helium because the liquid helium is used as a cryogenic cooling fluid. Helium, has a room helium at a room temperature is lighter than air, which is why balloons, when filled with helium, always float to the ceiling. Helium has a boiling temperature of minus 269 degrees centigrade. This is needed to keep the magnet very cold. The gradients, which I'll explain more about in a bit, send energy into the machine to get the signal that we're interested in. And the magnets heat up and a small amount of helium boils off. These magnets are very expensive because of the amount of helium they use. Even when the MRI unit is doing nothing, it's still using up helium, although in very small amounts. A superconducting magnet has a field strength of 0 0.5 tesla or higher. At the MRI centre where I work we have two scanners, one of which is a 1.5T and the other is a 3T. And just to put things into perspective, the Earth's magnetic field is 0 0.5 gauss and one tesla is equal to 10,000 gauss. 
This means that a one Tesla scanner is 20,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. A scanner of 3T, or 3 Tesla, is 60,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And in some centres, such as in Nottingham, where they have a 7T scanner, that would be 140,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. But this strong magnetic field poses a real danger. Certain materials with ferromagnetic properties, such as iron, will be attracted into the magnet. Hazardous items that we would not want people to take into the scanning room include belts, phones, clips, laptops and fire extinguishers. All patients might have certain med <clears throat> also patients might have had certain medical implants which are contraindications for MRI scanning, such as cer certain prosthesis. Implants could include a pacemaker, shell fragments in the eyes, which is quite common in those who've worked in the steel industry, as well as metal plates or joints inserted during operations. Screening of the patient is therefore very important. It's necessary to ask some questions before the individual even gets into the, the MRI centre. Because if someone had a pacemaker, we wouldn't even want to let them into the building, never mind the scanning room. We can see here just some occasions where objects with ferromagnetic properties have found their way into the scanning room and consequently the magnet. In this top right image, we can see the people trying to get the chair back out of the scanner without actually quenching the system. So what is a quench and why wouldn't we want to do it? Well, if someone were stuck behind that chair, we would definitely quench the magnet. This boils off all the liquid helium which the magnet needs to operate. It does it very quickly and the person will be able to escape. It used to be called the £50,000 switch and now the cost of everything required to operate a scanner has gone up so much that it's now called the £80,000 switch. And this is how much it would cost approximately to repair the magnet following a quench and this is why we would want to avoid pressing the button at all costs. Having an MRI scan is quite an experience. There are, there are occasions because of the magnetic field where some people will be unable to have a scan. In cases where people can there are, are still risks to think about. One of the main hazards in MRI is the noise that is produced as a result of the gradient fields. The patient always needs to wear earplugs, not just any earplugs, but special industrial strength ones pre-approved by the health and safety advisor. Also, people may be claustrophobic. I don't know anybody who likes being placed in confined spaces. Nobody likes that. But it's when, it, when people start to have panic attacks or become so distracted by the space that it becomes a problem. We will always say to people that if they start to panic, just give the emergency buzzer a squeeze and we'll come and get you out. The size of the tunnel is even more of a problem for people who are slightly larger in size, as they tend to have less free room around them, making it much more uncomfortable. Staying still is also another problem. The person must stay still for a long period of time, and this can be a problem for some patient groups, particularly children and old people or people with certain neurological disorders. Now if you were sent for an MRI scan by your doctor, then this is the kind of experience that you might expect. Welcome to this MRI patient education videotape. Your physician has ordered an MRI medication condition. What is MRI? MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and for the next few minutes, we'll discuss the MRI examination. You'll see some of the remarkable images produced by this type of medical imaging exam. These are MR images of the brain. They're astoundingly clear and detailed. Here, in addition to the brain, we can see the spinal cord, sinuses, teeth, and even the blood vessels. 
Just what makes MRI so different from other medical imaging techniques, such as conventional x-rays and computed tomography, known as CT scans? And under what circumstances is MRI the preferred imaging technique? Let's see. X-ray devices are generally used to take projection images of hard tissues like bones. CT scans take images of both hard bony tissues and soft tissue, such as the brain. Both X-ray and CT systems use X-ray beams, which travel through the body and project an image onto a photographic film or display it on a video monitor. MRI, on the other hand, works differently. MRI uses a magnetic field to orient the position of certain nuclei in the body. The primary nuclei used for MRI imaging is in the hydrogen atom, called a proton. As you know, the body is made up of approximately 75% water. Water is two parts hydrogen, making the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, the proton, the most abundant in the human body. A radio wave is then used to excite the proton, which resonates and emit varying signals, which are received, digitized, and displayed as images. Different signals emitted by different body tissues are then used to differentiate individual anatomy. When tissue is damaged, its composition changes and gives off an uncharacteristic signal. So when displayed, that damaged tissue is distinguishable from surrounding healthy tissue. Once again, it's important to point out that MRI utilizes magnetic fields and radio waves. Patients are not exposed to x-rays or other ionizing radiation. On the day of your examination, it's a good idea to arrive a little early in order to complete your patient information records and to allow for a pre-examination screening. At this time, you may be asked some questions to make sure that you are eligible to undergo the MRI examination. For instance, Patients with metallic worn bodies or surgically implanted devices like cardiac pacemakers and aneurysm clips are not eligible. These devices may be adversely affected by the magnetic field. Objects containing ferrous metals will also interfere with obtaining a good MR image. Therefore, it's advisable to wear a sweatsuit, clothes without zippers, snaps, or buckles, or garments provided by the imaging facility. To improve the image quality, Particularly when examining the head, knee, or spine, a device called a coil is used. It operates just like an antenna to improve the signal reception. It's also possible that you may require an injection of contrast to enhance the distinction between certain tissues. This contrast is specific for MR imaging and is different from that used for CT and X-ray examinations. The need for this contrast will depend on the type of MR exam your physician has prescribed. The MRI exam generally takes between 20 minutes and one hour. During this time, a series of images will be taken. Each set of images requires several minutes to complete. An intercom system keeps you in two-way communication with the trained medical professional performing your exam, the MRI technologist. It is very important that you remain still while the images are being acquired. You'll know that an image is being acquired when you hear a knocking sound. You may relax when the machine is not making the knocking sound, but you must remain in the initial position unless you are instructed otherwise. If you move during the procedure, it may be necessary to repeat the exam. Although the MRI exam is painless, it does require you to remain still until the exam is complete. Patients often try to nap. Mr. Smith enjoys golfing a lot. Perhaps he's thinking about his favorite course, concentrating on how relaxed he feels when he's playing. Think about something you enjoy doing. It really helps. Once complete, your magnetic resonance images will be processed and sent to your physician who will discuss the results with you. Hopefully, spending these few minutes learning about magnetic resonance imaging has prepared you for your examination. However, should you have any questions, you're welcome to this MRI patient education. So what we've already said is that um, MRI, an MRI scanner um, can produce different types of images. And the kinds of images that we collect for an experimental task um, wouldn't really allow a patient to listen to music or think about anything other than the task at hand. 
So the video briefly covered um, the principles behind the MRI signal. So we're going to look at that in more depth now. MRI makes use of the magnetic properties of brain tissues and other substances, for example, blood. A participant's head is inserted into a, long, a large cylindrical magnet, the field of which disrupts the magnetic properties of the hydrogen protons in the brain, causing them to resonate. The main proton of interest is hydrogen. Hydrogen occurs in large quantities throughout the body because it's contained in water. But water itself is not magnetic, but the hydrogen atoms in water have a magnetic moment. Essentially, we can look at any nucleus with unpaired protons or neutrons, but hydrogen gives a better signal than other nuclei. The hydrogen nuclei possesses a spin, which we call precession. And when the hydrogen nuclei is introduced into a magnetic field, this precession causes the hydrogen nuclei to act like a bar magnet. And this is what we can see here. When the hydrogen is placed into a magnetic field, it acts like a little bar magnet. It has a north pole and a south pole. When placed in the scanner, the protons can either align with or against the magnetic field that they are exposed to. There is a slight excess of spins aligned with the magnetic field versus against it. In fact, for every 10 million protons on the higher energy level, so aligned against the magnetic field, there are approximately 10 million and 7 protons on the lower energy level, so aligned with the magnetic field, which we can see here. The magnetic field is referred to as beta zero, and the net magnetic moment is always aligned with the magnetic field. The net magnetic moment is referred to as the net magnetization vector, so NMV or simply M. hydrogen nuclei will spin around its own axis. This is referred to as precession. Here we have the z-axis, which in this case is the alignment of the magnetic field, beta zero. The protons precess at an angle around beta zero. The precession movement is like a spinning top. It can be represented by a vector. So how quickly does the hydrogen proton precess and why is this important? Well, firstly, it's important because it's directly influenced by the strength of the external magnetic field, beta zero. The precession frequency of the proton is defined by the Lama equation, which is omega zero equals gamma times beta zero. Gamma is the gyromagnetic ratio, which is a constant unique to every atom and beta zero is the strength of the external magnetic field, as we've already said. We can see from this that the precession frequency is then directly influenced by the strength of the magnetic field. This precession frequency is important because it will influence the signal that we receive from the scanner. So for a hydrogen proton, gamma equals 42.5 megahertz per tesla which means that the proton will precess at 42.5 million times per second. So if we had a scanner with a magnetic field strength of 1.5 tesla, the protons would be precessing at a frequency of 64 megahertz. Hydrogen protons are contained in varying quantities throughout the body. Grey matter, white matter and CSF will contain varying amounts of water. CSF contains more water than white matter and white matter contains more water than grey matter. The signal that each type of tissue gives us is different and this is what we use for constructing the MR image. 
the net magnetization vector cannot be measured directly. Instead, we have to introduce a radio frequency pulse, which is an electromagnetic wave or radio frequency pulse. RF pulse. The RF pulse is applied at the same precession frequency as the hydrogen protons. The protons absorb the energy and this is called resonance. The RF pulse tilts or flips the protons resulting in transversal magnetization. The protons are tilted 90 degrees. Once the RF pulse is switched off and the net magnetization vector will attempt to align with beta zero again. This process is termed relaxation. When the proton realigns with beta zero, it releases energy or RF waves. The, rate, the receiver coil, which is positioned within the magnet, picks this up and this forms the MR signal. Different tissues contain different amounts of protons and because of this, different tissues will lose their signal at different rates. There are many hydrogen atoms in the brain, but we can't get a signal from a single hydrogen atom because this would be too weak. So we measure the signal from a number of hydrogen atoms within a small space in the brain, specifically a cube of brain tissue, which we call a voxel. We need to break the brain up into a series of slices, going sagittally left to right, coronally front to back and horizontally top to bottom. This block of squares is pretty much how the brain is broken down. And we can see this here. This is slices going from anterior to posterior and slices going from the top of the brain to the bottom of it and here we can see slices going from left to right. In this way we can break the brain down into a series of neatly aligned cubes. We refer to these cubes as voxels and they might be between one and three millimeters cubed. We might have any number of hydrogen protons in each cube which will obviously differ depending on the type of tissue we're looking at. The resonance of these hydrogen protons across the whole of the voxel is picked up by the receiver coil. For simplicity from now on, we will think of the voxels, of each voxel as a single proton. So one of these voxels gives us one signal, which we use to construct a 3D image of the brain. We can manipulate the hydrogen protons across the brain using gradients to give us a different signal in each voxel in the brain. Let's talk more about how we get this signal. So far, what we have covered is how to apply one radio frequency pulse and get a signal. The signal that we get back here is from all hydrogen protons in the brain at once. But this isn't helpful to us if we want to understand what the signal is in different regions of the brain. To know where the signal is coming from, for instance, to get a signal in a voxel that is in medial prefrontal cortex, we need to produce a three-dimensional map of the brain and determine the signal in each position of the map. So we take a slice or matrix of vox voxels and we apply different radio frequency pulses to obtain a signal for each voxel in each slice of the brain. We apply three different gradients, a slice selection gradient, a frequency encoding gradient and a phase encoding gradient. These will linearly alter the magnetic field that the tissue is exposed to in the direction in which it is applied. The radio frequency pulses are sent along each of these gradients and that is what is used to tilt the protons to the transversal plane. The slice selection gradient is used to select a slice of the 3D object and from this slice the row and column can be selected to get a signal from each voxel. 
So we said before that the protons go into the magnet and that they are ex all exposed to the same magnetic field strength and so precessed at the same frequency. When a gradient is applied, it changes the magnetic field strength that the protons are exposed to so that the protons precess at different frequencies. And we can see this here. In A, one radio frequency pulse is applied. And then in B, a second one is applied along another axis to alter these columns. And then a third one, the phase encoding gradient, is applied so that we get in each column a different signal. And in each row a different signal. Let's have a look at that in more detail again. We can see here how we can change the parameters of the slice selection gradient to change the thickness of the slice. Basically, the slice select gradient can be applied along a shorter or longer range of frequencies to create a thicker or thinner slice. The same principle applies to the other gradients also. However, in the majority of scenarios, isotropic voxel size is chosen. By putting all of these slices together, we can get a 3D image of the human brain. To summarise what we have covered so far, most MRI scanners have superconducting magnets creating a magnetic field of 1.5 tesla or 3 tesla. The MRI signal comes from the hydrogen nucleus or proton of water molecules. The protons are aligned with or against the external magnetic field and are associated with different energy levels. The difference in energy is proportional to the magnetic field strength and is the net magnetization vector. The head coil gives energy to the protons using ra radio frequency of pulses, allowing some of the protons to flip to the higher energy level. As the protons relax back to their original energy levels, they give off energy, which is the signal we detect to create an image. Contrast agents, such as gadolinium, might be used to increase the contrast between different tissue types. Once injected, gadolinium-based contrast agents accumulate in abnormal tissues of the brain and body. This accumulation provides a greater contrast between normal and abnormal tissues, allowing doctors to better locate uncommon cell growth and tumours. Although gadolinium is a metal, as an MRI contrast, gadolinium agents are shellated compounds and are considered safe enough to use in most people. Shellative describes a particular way that ions are bound so that they cannot interact with other elements or ions. So we can alter the radio frequency pulse and the time to collect the emitted radio frequency signal to alter the amount of longitudinal and transversal relaxation that we obtain. This will create different images and we can see here these are the T1, T2 and proton density images. T1 weighted images are largely based on longitudinal relaxation. T2 weighted images are largely dependent on the transversal relaxation. And proton density depends on the quantity of hydrogen within each tissue. So where there are more protons in the brain, there will be a stronger signal. Each of these different types of scans may be used for different reasons. So for instance, a T1-weighted image is used if we want to be able to clearly distinguish between grey matter and white matter and CSF. A T2-weighted image is most often referred to as a diagnostic scan because it's good at showing tumours and brain abnormalities. And proton density scans are better at visualising some structures, 
So it really depends on what you're wanting to look at. So what is the origin of the fMRI signal? A functional MRI scan is used when we want to know what region of the brain is involved in a particular task. fMRI is based on the premise that a region of the brain that is involved in a particular task will use more oxygen and other substrates such as glucose, therefore stimulating an increase in local blood flow. There is a series of events that happens before we get to the MRI signal change. Firstly, there is some sort of neural response, which is the neurons firing in the brain in response to a task or stimuli. Then there are physiological changes that occur as a result of this, which is oxygen and glucose metabolism of neurons. The net effect of this is changes in the level of deoxyhemoglobin in the local blood supply. Changes in the level of deoxyhemoglobin have direct effects on the MRI signal that we can collect and results in the build signal that we record, which is the blood oxygenated dependence level. Now, if something is said to be diamagnetic, it is said to be non-magnetic, whereas something that is paramagnetic is said to be more magnetic. Meaning that deoxyhemoglobin is affected more by the magnetic field than oxyhemoglobin. So the deoxyhemoglobin would lose its signal faster than the oxyhemoglobin. This means that the MRI signal is sensitive to the paramagnetic properties of deoxyhemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin causes local magnetic field disturbances, causing the water protons to resonate at different frequencies, therefore losing its signal quicker. The higher the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin, the lower the MRI signal that we obtain. High levels of oxyhemoglobin in a region of brain tissue will result in a stronger MRI signal. This small signal increase is the bold signal recorded by fMRI. So let's have a look at that in more detail. At resting state, as we can see here, oxygen consumption of the brain region is relatively stable and there is no difference in deoxyhemoglobin within or outside the neural tissue. But when there is an increase in oxygen metabolism due to neuronal activation, there will be an increase in deoxyhemoglobin in the, in the local blood supply. This is due to the coupling of neural activity and oxygen metabolism. Because the neurons use up the oxygen when they're engaged in a task. When there is an increase in oxygen metabolism due to neuronal activation, there will be an increase in deoxyhemoglobin in the local blood supply. But because of the neural activity, there will be an increase in blood flow to that region. The increase in blood flow to that region will also result in a decrease of deoxyhemoglobin within that region, thereby, thereby increasing the signal recorded within the region. So let's go back. At rest there's no difference either within the cell or outside the cell in terms of levels of deoxyhemoglobin. When the neurons become active because they're engaged in a task, they increase the amount of oxygen consumption. So there's an increase in oxygen metabolism and therefore an increase in deoxyhemoglobin in the local blood supply. There is then an increase in oxygen-rich blood flow to the region which is engaged in the task and therefore a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin in the local blood supply. Blood flow increase has a much larger effect than the oxygen metabolism change. So the small increase in deoxyhemoglobin in the local blood supply that we saw as a result of oxygen metabolism 
is often too small to be measured. It's the oversupply of oxygen-rich blood, i.e. oxyhemoglobin, that follows the neural activity that is actually recorded. The net effect is a reduction in deoxyhemoglobin within surrounding venous blood. This has an effect of increasing the fMRI signal. Because as we said, deoxyhemoglobin loses its signal faster because it's disturbed more by the magnetic field. The two curves in this graph represent the decay of fMRI signal in a magnetic field with larger inhomogeneities, which is represented by the blue line, and smaller inhomogeneities represented by the red line. The function of the bold signal against time in response to a temporary increase in neuronal activity is known as the hemodynamic response function, or HRF. What the graph shows us is that after a small increase in neuronal activity, there is a small increase in deoxyhemoglobin in the blood. As the active neurons use oxygen, this, re this results in a drop in signal, which we can see here. This small drop in signal is very small and not always found. There is then a large increase in the bold signal, which reaches its maximum at approximately six seconds due to the oversupply of oxygen-rich blood. Finally, the level of deoxyhemoglobin in the blood returns to normal, following a brief undershoot. Because of this rapid change in the bold response, we need to collect the scans of the whole brain very quickly. We can do this using a very fast EPI scan in two to three seconds. This sort of image is sensitive to the amount of deoxyhemoglobin in the blood. However, because we are taking a picture of the whole brain very quickly, we compromise spatial resolution and the picture quality of the image is poor. So what are the limits of spatial and temporal resolution? Well, there's usually some sort of negotiation or payoff between spatial and temporal resolution in MRI so by increasing the temporal resolution, the spatial resolution may suffer. As we have just seen, in order to know where the bold signal is coming from in response to a task, we need to collect a full scan of the brain very quickly. But to do this, we need to choose a larger voxel size and therefore we compromise spatial resolution. This is why we repeat the task a number of times and we average the signal across these sessions. Temporal resolution is defined by the ability to distinguish successive activations in the same region. The bold signals can be separated if stimuli are presented greater than four seconds apart. Because of the spatial resolution of fMRI, we would typically overlay activation from our fMRI scan onto an anatomical scan such as a T1 weighted scan, which is better spatial resolution. So let's have a look now at what happens in a simple fMRI experiment. As you can see, the person goes onto the bed and the bed is placed inside the scanner in the magnet. The head is moved into the bore of the magnet, which is the point of magnetic homogeneity. They have a head coil to optimise the signal. They are given an emergency buzzer which the patient presses if they start to panic and need to come out. In an fMRI study, a projector would be required to display the experimental task of the participant on some sort of screen so that they can see what they need to be doing and when. And if a response is required, the participant will be given a button box in order to respond. In a typical fMRI experiment, the experimental paradigm is usually made up of some sort of experimental condition, which is the condition of interest. But this typically involves activation of many processes that are not of interest to the researcher. For example, the researcher may be interested in understanding what is happening when a person processes faces. If the researcher were to show the participants pictures of faces, there would be activity associated with processing visual stimuli, so there'd be lots of activity in the visual cortex. And if the participant had to respond by pressing a button, there would be activity in the motor cortex. And presumably, if there was some sort of button pressing, 
there will be some sort of decision-making involved. Most of this the researcher isn't interested in. So to know what it is that is so unique about faces, we need a comparable control condition that subtracts out the visual and motor activity. This might be made up of objects that are non-face related but are equally complex. So we might not want to show a simple picture of a comb or a spoon. Sometimes researchers also add a rest condition into the paradigm that involves the participant typically focusing on a, fix a fixation cross in the middle of the screen. Normally the participant is instructed to simply relax and to not think about anything in particular when the cross appears. The purpose of this is to allow the bold response to return to baseline. However, there have been some discrepancies as to the usefulness of the fixation cross in recent years. And this is really a matter of how you intend to model this data in your statistical model. There are two main types of fMRI design that you might want to adopt. The first is the block design and the second is the event related design. Block design is the most popular in, and involves subtracting one condition from another condition, which differs only in the cognitive process of interest. Event-related designs involve modelling the hemodynamic response function after each stimulus. This is averaged, however. This is averaged. However, the statistical power of event-related designs is inherently low because the signal change in bold fMRI signal following a single stimulus presentation is small. The statistical power is higher in block design. Parameters that you would need to consider include the length of time each stimulus should be presented for and how long the block should be shown, or how many blocks are needed. These parameters are very much based on the cognitive process of interest. There are no hard and fast rules here, but typically blocks should be no shorter than 15 seconds because of the time of the hemodynamic response function. So let's have a look at our simple experiment to show processing of faces. We take each voxel in the brain and see what's happening in each voxel across the task. So if we were to look at one, let's say here. We see what the bold response is when the person's doing nothing. Then when we present the, the participant with some faces and allow them to rest and then show them some pictures of houses, which is our control condition, we model a bold response. And we do this several times with different images. We might have 10 blocks for each condition. Then when we subtract activity for the houses from activity in response to faces, we should get our signal of interest. This study was performed by Haxby et al. 2001 and the results were published in Science. We will now briefly look at diffusion tensor imaging. Diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, is used to infer the axonal organisation of the brain by measuring the translational displacement of water molecules. The motion or diffusion of water molecules is much faster along white matter fibres than perpendicular to them because there are fewer obstacles to prevent movement along the fibres. DTI takes diffusion measurements in multiple directions and using tensor decomposition extracts the diffusivities parallel and perpendicular to the fibres, also termed principal diffusivities. The difference between these two motions, i.e. parallel and perpendicular to the fibres, is referred to as diffusion anisotropy and forms the basis of DTI. DTI allows us to map the white matter tracks in the brain, which are the myelinated axons connecting the neurons. 
Inside cells where water is constrained, the mean diffusion, or ADC, is slow. The intensity of each pixel in the ADC map is proportional to the extent of diffusion. Water molecules in bright regions diffuse faster than those in dark regions, which we can see in the image here on the left. We can see that water diffuses much more quickly in the CSF, which we can see in the ventricles there. Now, fractional anisotropy is the most, or FA, is the most widely used DTI-based index in brain research for representing the most motional anisotropy of water molecules, being sensitive to the presence and integrity of white matter fibres. Water motion in CSF is isotropic, tropic, meaning that diffusion is roughly equivalent in all directions. In other words, water diffuses freely in isotropic. In white matter, diffusion is anisotropic, so it's highly directional, as axonal membranes and myelin sheaths present barriers to the motion of water molecules in directions not parallel to their own orientation. Fractional anisotropy images, also referred to as FA maps, are grayscale 2D maps representing diffusion anisotropy on a voxel-by-voxel -voxel basis with intensity limits between 0 and 1. FA maps exhibit high signal where intensity limits approach 1 in areas of significant anisotropic motion. In contrast, a low signal where intensity limits would be around zero is shown in areas of isotropic motion. High levels of diffusion in white matter, represented by the ADC map, are indicative of poorly developed, immature or structurally compromised white matter. High levels of anisotropy are considered a reflection of coherently bundled myelinated fibres oriented along the axes of the greatest diffusion. The colour-coded orientation map allows us to visualise the 3D information contained in the FA maps. The direction of maximum diffusivity may be mapped using red, green and blue colour channels with colour brightness modulated by fractional anisotropy, resulting in a convenient summary map from which the degree of anisotropy and the local fibre direction can be determined. The most basic red-green-blue colour-coded scheme distributes a colour for each orientation of the fibres. Fibres crossing left to right are visualised in red, whereas fibres crossing anteriorly to posteriorly are visualised in green, and fibres crossing inferiorly superiorly are visualised in blue. Diffusion tensor tractography is useful for looking at white matter tracks in the brain. It involves picking a seed voxel and then joining the tensor within that voxel to surrounding tensors. This is referred to as streamlining. The streamlines are terminated when they reach a low anisotropy region where there is no coherent fiber organization. And we can see an example of DT tractography in the image here for areas connecting Broca's area and Wernicke's area. I hope that you've enjoyed this session. The end.